Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody to the launch webinar of a new online course, Pandemic Preparedness and Response, Dynamic Health System Resilience. My name is Bea Wethrich, and I'm Senior Manager of Content Development for the Global Learning Collaborative at Partners in Health. I am really excited to be here with all of you today. Many of you have worked with so much commitment and caring over the last year to fight this pandemic and build a better future with the right to help for all. So we're here today to learn and we're also here today to lean on each other, on each other's strength, wisdom, and the collective will and wisdom of all of you. So we hope that during this pandemic, you share your experience. We have a Q&A box, we have a chat, and we hope that this begins a conversation that continues both through the course and beyond as we work together to end this pandemic and to have a better future. So I'd like to introduce Liberty Wickman, who is Chief Training Officer of the Center for Global Health, and she'll talk us through a, through a few things about the uh, webinar itself. Liberty. Thanks, B. Um, welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'd like to point out that we have simultaneous translation available. You can click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and select your preferred audio channel between English and Spanish. Bienvenidos a todos. Tenemos traducción Welcome everybody. We have simultaneous video. translation available today. Pueden seleccionar su canal de idioma. You can select your language of choice. Dando clic al globo abajo By de clicking la on the globe icon at the bottom of the screen. And we also have the question and answer function open today. So if you have a question you'd like to direct to the panelists, please submit it through the Q&A rather than the chat. The chat is available for commentary and the Q&A function is available for questions. Okay, then it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Phaedra Henley and Dr. Anatoly Mansi today. Phaedra is the chair and assistant professor at University of Global Health Equity and the Center for One Health and is co-director of the Pandemic Preparedness and Response course in Dynamic Health Systems Resilience. Dr. Anatoly Mansi is the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Clinical Quality and Health Systems Strengthening Director of Partners in Health and the Global Learning Collaborative and is Co-Director of Pandemic Preparedness and Response Dynamic Health Systems Resilience course. Thank you, Liberty. I think you can hear me now, right? Yeah. Awesome. So, um, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Partners in Health, uh, Social Salud, uh, and uh, the University of Global Health Equity. Uh, nine months ago, uh, Partners in Health and the UGHE um, organized a short course on equity approach uh, to pandemic pre preparedness and response. This course was one of the most attended events of the year. Uh, at the end of the four sessions that we organized, participants expressed the desire to extend the sessions. Our leadership and the senior faculty that we have today committed to come back and avail the content to those who could not make it due to time difference and technological challenges. Here we are. We are here with uh, individuals that I, I personally call the global health leaders of all time and champions in pandemic preparedness and response. Before we get into conversations here, I would like to call on my friend and co-director, Dr. Henley, to, serve, uh, to help us and give an overview of why we are here today 
and really try to set the stage for this conversation. Uh, Dr. Henley. Thanks so much, Dr. Manzi, and hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to part two of the Pandemic Preparedness and Response course. Uh, today's launch webinar will introduce you to our new certificate program made up of eight modules and will show you why we urgently need this course. Since we last met in July 2020, a lot has happened in the evolution and response to COVID-19. Some countries have performed exceptionally well, almost eliminating the risk for the virus, while other countries' infections have surged and many more people have died. Several vaccines have been developed and executed across the world, and new, more aggressive variants of the virus have emerged, causing increased risks. Since the first iteration of our course, we recognize that there are many lessons across the globe that are needed to be captured and shared. We see now more than ever that global solidarity is an immediate and long-term requirement for pandemic preparedness and response. We continue to see that without addressing health equity as a central principle, we cannot effectively respond to COVID or prepare for other epidemics. This is particularly true now with the urgent need for equitable access to vaccines in order to control COVID-19 globally. We have seen that many low to middle income countries, particularly in Africa, lead in their preparedness and response to COVID-19, with success coming from strong and decisive leadership, decentralization of care, social mobilization to support the impoverished, and implementation of evidence-based interventions. Leaders who have listened to science have been most successful. With the understanding that the virus causing COVID-19 emerged from a bat and spilled over to humans, a One Health approach is crucial in comprehensively addressing the health of people, animals, and the planet. Countries with a governance structure that reflects One Health and champions interdisciplinarity and multi-sectoral collaboration have also performed better in their COVID-19 response. At the heart of a response are frontline health workers who need the support of governments, institutions, and public in order to provide care and health services. In our new self-paced online certificate course, we have created four new modules and case studies based on these lessons and objectives I've just described to complement the four modules from the first version of the course that have been updated, improved, and expanded. You will work through these eight, mo eight modules seen here that are designed to explain the evolution of COVID-19 and other pandemics in the context of equity, health systems resilience, and a One Health approach. If we could go to the, the next slide, we'll talk about, uh, brings us to today's session, which is a kickoff and introduction to this online certificate course and the learning portal. In this session, we will learn lessons from our expert panelists who are global COVID-19 response leaders. They will share an overview of key lessons from Partners in Health, Socio en Salud, University of Global Health Equity, and collaborators in pandemic preparedness and response captured in new case studies. Together, they will encourage and inspire you to sign up and register for our course to learn more and to share the opportunities with friends and colleagues. I would now like to introduce um, our panelists. If we can go to the next slide. Our first panelist is uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, who is the co-founder and chief strategist of Partners in Health. And he is also the co-founder and chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity. Next, we have Professor Anyas Pinawaho, who is a professor, the Vice Chancellor and Co-Founder of the University of Global Health Equity. Next, we have Dr. Leonid Licka, who is the Executive Director of Socio en Salud in Peru. And last, our fourth panelist is Dr. Joya Mukherjee, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health and a visiting faculty member at the University of Global Health Equity. Before we go into our panel, this is just a reminder to please select and stay on the language channel that you require and to please put any questions you may have for the panelist into the question and answer function. I'd now like to turn it back over uh, to Dr. Manzi to kick off the panel. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Henley, for, for this. Uh, I think I'm going to have to 
make sure that we have our panelists ready there. And uh, I have some questions that I will have to ask. And obviously I invite everyone to send questions uh, because the goal here is to make sure that we address questions and uh, share some insights with regards to pandemic preparedness and response and dynamic health systems resilience. I have uh, uh, one question here to get started. Um, we were here last year, uh, nine months ago, and we talked about equity approach to pandemic preparedness and response. This, we didn't know everything. So now the question is, what do we know now that we didn't know nine months ago? And this is a question that eventually I, I would love each panelist to answer to. And obviously if other panelists, other participants have some insights, please do share through our um, Q and A uh, box that we're gonna pass soon. So uh, the first goes to you, uh, uh, Joya, if you could address that first, it would be super helpful and we will continue and each panelist will have to share the views. Uh, Dr. Joya, you must be on mute, please. You'd think we'd learn by now in the Zoom world. Um, I'm really excited to be with all of you and very excited about this pandemic course. Um, we are always learning, but I have to say uh, about some of these things, we saw this inequity coming. And we saw it coming because of our vast experience across many continents with many amazing partners that have shown that diseases track along the fault lines of society whether they're infectious diseases or non-communicable disease. If you have a broken leg, your outcome is much more likely to be a good one if you live in a wealthy country and if you live in a wealthy community within a wealthy country. I think the extra challenge with pandemics is these inequities create risks for everyone. And even though those risks aren't equal, they are nonetheless there. So I think we've seen at least three levels of inequity. Um, and one is just the inequity within countries, you know, communities like in the United States, farm worker communities, uh, black communities, communities that are historically impoverished have less access to care, less access to testing and have a, had less access to vaccination. So not surprisingly, we've seen a two to three fold higher death rate in communities of color in the United States. The second level of inequity we have is between countries. And you really see the role of leadership, of national leadership in a differential response. In our country, the first year of the pandemic, we had leadership under President Trump that denied science that was very muddy and unclear about what the path forward ought to be. And we see that that really created problems within the country for everyone. Um, and that it was very different than in countries like Rwanda, which we will hear more about, where leadership was clear, was related to science, and was disseminated widely from the very beginning. But then we have a third level of inequality, which is around the globe. And that is what we're really facing now, where <clears throat> we see that there are plenty of resources in the world to deal with this pandemic. We know that trillions of dollars of economic losses have been sustained. Um, and what it would take is billions, not trillions, to vaccinate the entire world, but we are lacking the political will of solidarity. And therefore, on the African continent, uh, only about 1% of the population has received vaccination yet. We do see some countries have done better than others, but there has been a huge lack of political will to uh, assure 
this equity, the kind of equity that we now have around HIV drugs globally that we did not have 20 years ago. So we're talking about inequities within countries, between countries, and across the globe. And these are ways that we really want to dive in in this course and think about how do we analyze them and how do we push for solutions. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. I would love to invite um, Dr. Baca, if you want to uh, chime in here, uh, to answer the same question. What do we know now that we didn't know uh, nine months ago? Sí, muchas gracias, Anatol. Eh, buenos días con todos. Gracias por la oportunidad. Thank you very much, Anatol. Good morning, everybody. I'm speaking in Spanish. Actually, we have learned a lot as a result of the pandemic. I fully agree with what Dr. Yoya has said. A key issue has been political leadership here in Peru, for instance. There was a rapid response from the political perspective. However, that has not been enough to stop the spread of the pandemic. We had a lot of challenges regarding diagnosis, treatment, and now access to vaccines. We have seen a lot of inequity. At first, we didn't have access to molecular tests. The market had its preferences. We had to use what we had. We haven't had access. We haven't had access to oxygen. We still, we're still facing a high peak on this second wave. And the third issue had to do with a limitation of the healthcare services. Unfortunately, here we had a weak hospital capacity before the pandemic in terms of ICU beds. We began the pandemic with 300 beds for a country of over 30 million inhabitants. In the first wave of last year, it went up to 1,800. Now we are going through a second wave with 2,200 beds, ICU beds. That is still not enough. And the other problem we faced was the closure of the first level of care. They decided to focus the efforts at the hospital level. So we've had a huge problem of containment at the primary healthcare level for people with suspicions of COVID, but people who have other healthcare problems. And this is linked to the poverty of communities. We have 70% uh, of the population living in informality, working and living of their day-to-day -day work with strict lockdowns. This has worsened even more, and the access to services paid by the same people has been much more difficult. So these inequities are the ones we have faced, and we are still trying to overcome them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Laka. I think this is really um, a great consideration and it more we learn from our response to pandemic uh, to COVID-19 uh, here. So um, I wanted to go to you, uh, Professor Agnes, um, to the same question. What do we know now uh, that we didn't know uh, last year, nine months ago? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Manzi. So I totally agree with uh, Joya and Leo. Uh, for the vir virus, we didn't know that it will be a pandemic when it started. It was an outbreak in China and after that in the region. And after that, it was declared a pandemic. We didn't know that. And it's the first time during our lifetime. It's not the first time the world faced a pandemic, but it's the first time we faced uh, uh, a pandemic. So we didn't know the type of organ it will attack with the extent of the, the people who are susceptible to the virus, uh, the, the biological predeterminant, etc. But we knew a lot. Yeah. We knew yeah. how to protect ourselves against such type of virus. We knew that we need PPE. Uh, we knew that we need to wash our hands, uh, uh, do social distancing. We knew what is the um, could be the impact of droplet of saliva coming out of somebody who uh, is infected. So we knew the EBI and the government of Rwanda enforced the evidence-based intervention backed by science. And we didn't invent anything. We just follow what scientific before us or with us have discovered. 
And we knew also what to do to implement the evidence-based intervention. For example, always be a coding context. Okay, in Rwanda, we have almost around 50% live, people living in poverty. We know that we have to do a lockdown. We have to do a lockdown. However, we have to support the vulnerable and the poor to eat every day and to continue to live during the time we protect all the country. But there is something we didn't know at all. And that surprised me, is the selfishness of some global leaders. And I can start with Tanzania, where the government reported to the country because of political in, um, uh, agenda and, re and to be reelected that COVID doesn't exist, it's a little flu. Um, uh, and uh, you can treat it by praying God or drink some uh, type of infusion. We have the same in Brazil, where the, the president of Brazil uh, went to uh, lead the denial movement. We had the same in the US, who was supposed to be the best country to have the best results uh, to, to face any outbreak and a pandemic, it's an outbreak in your country. It's the an outbreak around the world and they are lagging behind everybody. So what we knew, what we learned is that if you don't have the right leadership, the poor people will die more than what expected. It, what we have learned is that in period of crisis more than ever, the vulnerable have to be in the heart of any national preparedness and response plan. So this is uh, what we have to, to say and how this uh, curriculum will provide the people will follow it with the argument to be the great advocate of global health that we need to save a maximum of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good. I want to remind people who are online to send their questions uh, through our Q&A box. And I actually have my friend here and a colleague B who is helping me to track all those questions. So we will make sure that we address them. And uh, B, you can get ready to uh, maybe just uh, uh, bring some, some of those questions that people are asking. but. Before then, I want to uh, ask um, Dr. Farmer to address the same question really here. Uh, if you could comment on that, um, same question, what, what do we know now uh, that we didn't know uh, nine months ago? Well, I mean, since uh, I agree with Joya, Leo, and Agnes, um, I won't re uh, go back to those uh, uh, important points. But I, I, just picking up on what Agnes was saying, I would point out that, you know, a lot of uh, what we're discovering now uh, was already suspected nine months ago or experienced in previous epidemics and pandemics. So again, we, we understand, I mean, for example, uh, yeah, uh, the COVID-19 corona uh, virus uh, is probably from bats, but we knew that we suspected that then that's where other coronaviruses come from and maybe pass through a second animal uh, to humans. But the real drama of course is human to human uh, spread. That, that's the not ferret to human spread or minks or something. Uh, and, and so as Agnes pointed out, we knew a lot about what to do uh, and, and many of those predictions came through. Did, uh, did we know the vaccine would be ready within a year? Uh, within that short nine month time frame, Well, they told us it would be. I mean, I, I went to meetings in February uh, in which a number of vaccinologists who, you know, people, people Joy and I know from, from Boston said, oh, we will develop the vaccine, a new kind of vaccine, mRNA, but it'll be done in, you know, in a month and then we'll start trials. That's what happened. And that's what happened with the other vaccines as well. 
And as one of the things that might be good to do is to look back at the things we've been, we said nine months ago in the first installment of this course and see how often we were on track with, with predictions since they were based on things that had happened in the past. And, and I believe that's one of Joya's points. I think one of the things that uh, delights me um, and uh, doesn't surprise me entirely, but it certainly delights me is that we said back then and have said again and again that pandemics and epidemics and any kind of uh, health crisis exposes fissures in societies. And when I say in societies, I mean, yes, a, a nation state, the thing that everybody talks about now, but also villages, towns, cities, regions, continents. And, uh, and, and then we said, but this is a time as most crises are to pro to propel, to push forward progressive social policies. And, and I gotta say, I think that's, that's been, if I were to compare various surprises, that's been the biggest one for me. It, when you have decisive leadership, as Phaedra said, that is based on evidence, as Agnes said, as they both did, then you can expect a better uh, re result with fewer people dying. And as Agnes pointed out, fewer poor people dying and marginalized people dying. Again, is that a surprise? Not really. But as during World War II, when, uh, when Britain, for example, um, in the middle of the you know, massive aerial bombardment, started having more progressive policies that would ultimately lead in short order to the founding of their national health in, uh, insurance system, the NHS, but also because of food supplements, the British people grew more in height during those years of terrible uh, violence than they did in, in peacetime. What does that tell you? It tells you that efforts like Rwanda's to get those uh, changes and policies in place quickly will do better, which they have, which it has, but also that the opening up of new possibilities for social insurance, unemployment insurance, new infrastructure programs, massive investments, in public health where there haven't been any in, in 50 years, I'm talking about the United States now, you know, this happened because of COVID. So uh, as much as anything, I think, um, and, and I, I hope that it comes to pass in Brazil and I hope it comes to pass in Mexico and Peru, of course, especially. But I think that's one of the things we, we I, I am most struck by is not that we didn't know, but that we were right in predicting hopefully that this crisis could be an opening for progressive social change and for attacking the disparities that each of you has spoken about already. Uh, that's really good. I, I think it's uh, you know really important to echo that where you end up uh, uh, tackling the disparities that we have. And I, I think um, Professor Nyas mentioned the selfishness that we see and we continue uh, to see and obviously joy uh, uh, highlighted the solidarity, which is probably the antidote to what we are um, talking about here. So um, before I move on with uh, other questions, because I, I really enjoy speaking with you, uh, I, I don't want to be selfish in these questions. I wonder if we have some questions from online. B, is there any question? Can you raise one question from our participants? Then I will probably continue with the rest. There are so many great questions from our participants, and some of them will be addressed in subsequent um, panel questions. I, I think there are, there are questions about uh, equity. How do we ensure an equitable response within uh, countries where lockdowns have such a hard, uh, devastating impact on populations uh, is, is one question. And, uh, Another question is, is really, uh, what is most important? Is it um, taking care of the economy or is it health care of the people and how do those two things relate? Yeah, that, those are really great questions. I wonder if, uh, um, uh, Professor Nyes, if you could comment on the first one. Um. <clears throat> so how do we act with equity? Let's say, we don't know 
you are a leader, you don't know the situation of each and every citizen that is in under your responsibility. But what you know, it is the need of each and every citizen under your responsibility, meaning they need food, they need health, they need uh, security, they need to be reassured, they need to trust you, and it's your duty to make you trust. It's not their duty to trust you. So you know that you need to bring food every day on the table, health for everybody. So you have to do that as a basic. Second, you know who are the poor and the vulnerable, start with them. Because if you start with somebody with me, that will scream anyway if you try to starve me. Don't worry. Start with people who are in difficulties, the poor, the vulnerable, who, who have to struggle even on, on during the day-to-day -day time to have food on the table for the family and health for their family. So start with the vulnerable and make the people like me pay for it. Uh, that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, summary. I, I wonder, Joya, did you have any, any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll just take a specific example um, from what we're trying to do in the United States, in Massachusetts. Uh, we were asked, Partners in Health was asked by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to help scale up contact tracing. In other words, um, investigate each and every case, uh, talk to the people who were the contacts and give them the information to quarantine or isolate. Um, and what we had learned um, for, for many years is information is not the problem. You can give people the information, but if they don't have the material resources to carry that out, what, you know, what we might say agency, then they're not going to be able to do it. So I think the most important pro part of our contact tracing program is to say, here's the information. Can you do that? If you can't stay home, if you don't have a place to live, if you don't have a means to support your family, well, then you need the resources to do that, to, you know, to carry out that information. And, you know, certainly Paul's life's work is looking at this. And um, I'm sure Paul has a lot to add, but we've tried to actualize this. And I know Leo's team in Peru also did, you know, there's some amazing photos of you know, the community health workers who have been there in Caraballo for more than 20 years, they know the community and they can go out and provide testing, provide material resources because the trust is there. So I agree with Agnes, we should start with the most vulnerable, but we also need to develop systems that actually can get out to people and provide that material support. Um, and I think some places have been much better. I mean, if you look at most European countries, people are getting uh, material financial support. In the United States, we had a very, very long period without that. In some countries, there's very little to afford that material support. So I think really, trying to make concrete solidarity through food, transportation, shelter is a critical part of the response to any epidemic. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, Leo, if you want to uh, chime in uh, on that, especially really sharing experience from Peru. Yes, thank you, Anatole. It's what Georgia was just saying. We have prioritized uh, many regions in Peru, especially in the northern part of Lima, for you having an idea of what this is about. Lima North is almost like a country. In some cases, it's more than 3 million inhabitants. It's a lot of people, lots of people living in conditions of vulnerability. I was saying a minute ago, 70% of the populations live uh, with the money day to day. So when the government tell, told them stay at home, that was quite complicated. And we even found many 
uh, uh, spreading of the disease in the houses, in the households. We implemented the uh, contact uh, tracking and most of the contagions was in the houses. People that didn't have the tools to protect, they didn't have money for masks, they didn't have good ventilation, they didn't have uh, food resources. So everything was pretty complicated. We had to activate all these whole community network in the to get uh, with the contact tracing, with social protection, with mental health, and in many of these activities, basic activities that are were necessary and to link them with health facilities uh, that, as I said at the beginning, were closed. And that was a serious problem to take care of these communities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, say, thank you. say one thing before we leave the, the, this topic. Yes, please. Um, you know, it seems to me, just stepping back for a second, that each of uh, my friends and fellow panelists have focused very admirably on the material. Uh, uh, staff stuff, space and systems, doesn't get more material than that. Food baskets, unemployment checks, right? The people in Peru who were hurt the most were those in the informal economy because they couldn't, they didn't get cash transfers or insurance, unemployment insurance because they weren't employed in the formal sector. So these are a host of material things. So it's worth thinking at least a little bit about the opposition that has been put in front of us again and again by men, often by people in powerful positions. The question we're asking is protecting, what's more important, protecting people's health or restoring the economy? But they're not different things. The economy is not crafted by bats or the hand of God. It's crafted by people and has been labor and capital infrastructure beyond capital, uh, that's the, the formula. And so to divide this apart as two different things, right? Uh, that we either protect the people or we protect the economy, you know, we should become fluent in how absurd that is because that is not a real opposition. The real opposition is really those who have things and those who are shut out. And I don't want to sound like a class warrior or anything, but each of you has been focusing on the vulnerable for a reason, because they're the ones most likely to be harmed in a crisis like this. So I think when we hear the question, part of it, part of our response should be to push back, sometimes mildly, you know, not to push back against workers in the informal sector, but in, to push back against leaders who are allowing this entirely artificial dichotomy to flourish and make it into a debate that divides people as debates do, when in fact, uh, since they are both the same thing, the people and the economy, we have to uh, push back with an understanding of how material and reparative actions can save lives and always do. Sorry, B, for going out of order. No, and I'm going to add on what you say, uh, Paul, because there is the, the, the it's not, even economic calculation, it's greed, greed, nothing else. Because I can, even I'm, an, I'm a pediatrician, I'm a grandma, but I can calculate for you what the US have lost by not in care about the poor, the black, the colored people, I don't know how they call them. It costs so much to everybody to don't care about the poor. You know, come in Rwanda. We are one of the poorest country in the world. Estimate according World Bank and all those fake estimation. We are very rich. And we have see a down in economy, but if we didn't have take care about our poor, you will see us, oops, not going down but surfing down. And I'm sure for all countries like that. And unfortunately, who will pay this down in economy against the poor? So we need to teach the rich leaders, selfish and with full of greed, how it's an economic, uh, is, is reasonable to care about the poor. You know, you know, what I continue to see and, and learn from you, even from last year and this year, is your consistency in, in, in your focus. Uh, last year, we talked about, you know, uh, human-centered contact tracing, and now we are 
addressing these disparities, you are always saying people-centered. That's the formula. So uh, this is really great uh, ways to um, answer to those questions. And I, I wanna move on. Um, there's a question I wanted to ask you, uh, you uh, Paul, and, and really following up on your recent publication. So you just published a book and I really want to see how that, what you uh, emphasize on in this book, how they address the health system. So the question is, can we strengthen health systems while fighting uh, pandemics? And, and what is that formula? And maybe just uh, if you can tell us how you, in, in your book you address that or you give some insights, that would be super helpful. And that question from there, we will get into vaccine because I think there's a, there's a, we have a lot of questions uh, regarding vaccines. So it would be really good to spend the time there. Thanks, Monzi. Yeah, you know, vaccines are the ultimate human countermeasure, right? And we can, and just going back to this fake dichotomy between people and economy, you know, it's a good example. Um, but I just want to say, uh, in response to the question, can we strengthen health systems in the middle of a pandemic, I would say that's the best time to strengthen them. You know, if you're in the middle of a war, which unfortunately, a number of us have been close enough to, uh, to fear, you've seen with political violence, uh, a massive retreat of public health interventions, anything that's community based first to go including vaccination programs, right? Now they are also sometimes the only thing that survive conflict, but usually it's just, it's, it's just dreadful. In the middle of a crisis like this one is the very time to focus on strengthening health systems in part because people who are allowed to be oblivious, not because they're greedy, but because they're protected and privileged and some of them know it like a lot of us do, um, they, this is, they don't think every day about staff tough space and systems and support to the vulnerable. Uh, you know, it's hard to do that if you're not in any kind of proximity to extreme vulnerability, but everybody is now in proximity to extreme vulnerability. I mean, the uniquely poor performance of the United States this past year has meant 600,000 people dead. That's more than were claimed by all the wars that, that, that this country participated in, right? And, and certainly this is, and that could be an undercount as, as in Ecuador, Peru, other places where we're asking why is mortality so much higher even when we don't document a COVID death? So I would just say as concisely as I can, Monzi, I think that's exactly the time where you push forward health system strengthening. That dull project that has engaged us for all these decades right? It's suddenly vividly important to a lot of people shielded from uh, distress of, and, and despair and uh, premature loss. In other words, the people who are familiar and ha sometimes have a rank familiarity with that kind of suffering, they're already on our side, right? We need to stay on their side. And that we do with staff stuff, systems and support. And I think we've shown, and certainly, you know, uh, thinking about what Leo and the Socios team has done during this past and dreadful year in Peru has been to make a clarion call for paying attention to people who are shut out of that kind of protection, right? In Rwanda, which has an easier time, has had an easier time of it, has still used this to promote a series of social protection packages. So I think that's what we're seeing, Monzi. We're seeing that this is a time to move. And I'm really glad I work with people who believe that. Thank you. Uh, I, that, that's really great. And as one would argue that uh, it's time to propose on health system strengthening and tackle the pandemic. So it, it's it's uh, what you just say it is actually really, uh, you know, showing what we should be doing now. So uh, perfect timing to strengthen health system. So we're going to move on to uh, vaccine. So what role does vaccination play? within the broader public health pandemic response. And uh, this is really an important question. Um, uh, I want to bring this to you, Joya and Agnes, um, you know, given your role in uh, public health uh, and health system strengthening in general, if you could comment first, uh, it would be super helpful. Joya, do you wanna go first? Uh, Joy, you must be on mute. 
<laughs> we have partners in health uh, uh, around the world are supporting the initiative uh, that some call the People's Vaccine. This is a consortium of people, many African heads of state, um, many civil society organizations, as well as groups like UNAIDS, uh, led by a very strong uh, African feminist woman, um, Winnie Bonamiana. Um, and I think the, the, the idea of the people's vaccine is that a vaccine should be a global public good. And that to do that, to achieve uh, global vaccination, that we should get rid of the patents and share the know-how um, and, and move manufacturing around the world and increase the capability within Africa, within Asia, within Latin America to make vaccine because the the actual cost of the vaccine is probably pennies or a couple of dollars and and this is a really critical thing we have companies that were publicly financed by the united states by um by uh europe uh, to make this vaccine, um, and they are garnering huge amounts of profit. And while on one hand they're saying, oh yes, we will waive our patents during the pandemic, that's not a real promise. That is a kind of um, just it's sort of playing nicely, but it's not actually what needs to be done. We need the recipe, we need the ingredients, we need to transfer the technology. And we've seen companies do that before, not when the, the profits are so high, frankly. Um, so, you know, one of the encouraging things I would say from our AIDS experience is that even before there was a vaccine developed, there was a mechanism proposed to have sharing of that vaccine. And that mechanism is called COVAX. It's not that we don't support COVAX, but COVAX is too small. COVAX is really has one voluntary um, charitable donations of vaccine and money. Um, the United States under Joe Biden has put two and a half billion dollars into COVAX. Um, but their goal for the first year is 20% of the vaccine. We never had that goal within the HIV movement. We said everyone should be covered, right? And if we have a 20% goal, that means that perhaps uh, people in Latin America, in Africa, and parts of Asia will be vaccinated in 2024, in 2025. We cannot live with that reality. So while COVAX is a good idea, the, the, the really paltry imagination of it is not sufficient. And we really need a, a, a global sharing and a mass manufacturing to vaccinate the entire world. And it needs to be at the scale of a global war, uh, and it should be. And and I think you know that's really what we're fighting for. And we're you know certainly grateful that some vaccine is trickling out through Covax, but it is it is absolutely not sufficient. Uh, that's super helpful. So, Joy, I'm gonna probably build on what you just said. We can't uh, live with that reality. And I'm gonna build on that to ask uh, Prof. Agnes, uh, why equitable uh, distribution of vaccine? Why, why is this so important in a pandemic response? First of all, um, nobody will be safe if everybody is not safe in this situation. And this situation more than ever, because those crazy, stupid people full of nationalism are digging their own burial place in us. You know why? Because they are going to neglect it, people like me. Unfortunately, the virus is not stupid, continue its way on and do variants that will be resistant to the virus and it will bomb in their face. So they will join me in the tomb. So vaccinating the most vulnerable first, is really what you have to do. And the vulnerability is not necessarily linked to poverty. For me, 
the vulnerability is vaccine the health worker first, the community health workers also. And after that, people who are at risk to be infected, people in prison because of their overcrowded, people in refugee camp because they are overcrowded and come to people like me who can be isolated. Uh, I'm 67, so I'm eligible, but don't come to me first. You know why? Because if you come to me first, you don't really protect me. Go and stop the pandemic. And to stop the pandemic, you have to stop where it can spread. Where can it spread? Where people are overcrowded. Where are they overcrowded? In area where the, it's neglected. Prison, refugee camp, poor part of the city where people are living so many in the houses because they don't have, and I can continue like that. And so this is the reason why I totally agree with Joyan. And this is the reason why for me, COVAX is a failure. So big failure. COVAX is the testimony of the lie of high income countries who just signed that, I don't know why, to keep everybody quiet. But when the vaccine were there, they changed their mind and they became crazy and they want every, even the people without any risk age 20 to be vaccinated. Hmm? So there is a lot to do, a lot to change. And if not, we are going to have what I call the, tr the 3V failure, vaccine versus variant. Uh, you know, I have no comment. Um, you covered this all. And, uh, you know, you said until everyone is va vaccinated. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Leka, I have a question for you, but before then I wonder, uh, B, do you have any question from the audience that you want to raise? I think uh, a couple other questions about vaccines are whether or not they are protective enough or what other uh, measures need to continue to be put in place uh, to stop COVID. And uh, this is been addressed somewhat, and particularly thank you so much, Professor Agnes, for uh, for what you just said. But you know, the, the question of how is this, how has the America First vaccine strategy impacted uh, global uh, access to vaccines? Thanks. I think it's not only America First, you know, uh, DOB. It's high income country first. You see the state. Did you see Italy block a shipment going to Africa, paid already, and say just because we need it? Country became crazy and are worse than the pirates we are all fighting in the ocean, uh, in the ocean, in uh, the Indian Ocean. Okay. They are pirates. They are people without law, without, you, we cannot, they should all be in jail. So, but if it was Africa doing that, oh, we will see here the Cascabu protect humanity, etc. So it's not only America. Uh, that's what I want to say. Now, vaccine, we all know that they are protecting the people vaccinated, but not necessarily the people not vaccinated. And again, for solidarity and to protect each and everyone, measure continue up to time there is a spread of the disease inside the country. But I let the, my, my, my friends to continue. Can I just add something? I agree with Agnes. It's not, I don't think the problem is America first. I think the problem is artificial scarcity, right? Every country is going to try to vaccinate their own people first. That's sort of what nation states do. We can talk about getting rid of the nation state that I'm happy to talk about that another time. But the, the, the scarce nature of the vaccine is what's causing these wars and this pirating that Agnes is talking about. And the way to get around that is mass production, right? People aren't fighting over polio vaccine because we have plenty. And for example, when we started HIV scale up globally, you had to have a locked cabinet with a key for the antiretrovirals because everyone thought, oh my God, people are going to go crazy and steal them. Nobody steals antiretrovirals because there's plenty of them. They steal food, 
They steal infant formula, you know, uh, ceftriaxone, things that are scarce. So we have to get out of this idea that it's either we vaccinate the United States or we vaccinate Laos. It's not that. We need to vaccinate everyone. We need to put together the, the most um, international response to just massively manufacture. Because if we have the scarcity, then we have to make these decisions and the powerful are always gonna win. And so this is why greed and the protection of patents and the lack of imagination of really manufacturing enough for the world. And I wanna just go back and I, I'm gonna sort of tip this over to Leo because in terms of health system strengthening, one of the things that Leo has taught me is that Peru, the entire nation of Peru only has oxygen for like 5,000 people. I mean, in what world is that okay? So we're talking about running out of ventilators in the United States. There is no oxygen in a middle income country like Peru. So that health system strengthening should have happened. Peru was dealing with TB. Peru has dealt with many epidemics from cholera to, um, you know, malaria, dengue, et cetera. So, I mean, thinking of the long term, you know, it's not just a short term response. I don't know, Leo, if you want to talk about what you've seen in the health system, but it's really shocking. Uh, uh, Leo, do you want to comment on that? I think we, we have to come back to um, um, uh, Paul has some comment with, with regards to the same question as well. Hello, did you have any comment? You're on mute, Polo. Oh, sorry. I thought I thought Leo was going to speak. My apologies. I had a couple of technical uh, points to not the question of America first, which I think we've addressed by saying that that's not really the problem. That's what vaccine nationalism is. Um, but the technical points are in response to the question, what are some other countermeasures uh, that should complement vaccine uptake? Um, and let me just let me just point out uh, uh, that right now, at least in the United States, and as far as I can tell, anywhere, the way that vaccines are being rolled out is is on is based on demographic data, age, whether or not you're deemed an essential worker, or, or whether or not you're in a prison or a meat packing plant or whatever. Uh, th that's fine, right? But there will be outbreaks of COVID nineteen for years to come. And so we also should complement a that orderly vaccine proposal with an ability to respond to outbreaks uh, with ring vaccination where the contacts of the positive case are vaccinated and then the layer of contacts of their contacts are, are, are vaccinated. You know, it would be great, for example, if in nine months we could say, and, and by the way, this was a strategy already used by Rwanda on its, uh, on its Western flank as Ebola erupted in the DRC, uh, ring vaccination. We had a new vaccine, a new, the ultimate human countermeasure, right? So we need also to rethink how we're going to deal with the ongoing outbreaks that are gonna occur for years to come, um, alas. And, uh, and that's something that needs to happen now. So that in nine months from now, uh, or in the summer when we, when we meet, we should, we should be able to point to some specific activities around how the vaccine is used and also point with glee and satisfaction to Rwanda if it succeeds in advancing manufacture of new mRNA vaccines, because they also have implications for other pathologies ranging from dengue to malaria and agricultural uses. And, and again, as Joya pointed out, we're never gonna have as, uh, enough vaccine if we don't spread out the manufacturing. And a lot of us are very concerned to see that happen on the continent of Africa and know that Rwanda could pull that off. That was the point I had to make, sorry, Lindsay. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, Paul. That's really uh, helpful. So. Um, Back to you, Leo, if you, uh, yeah, I think I, your mic is working now. So do you have uh, any comments? And I specifically want you to really talk a little bit about, you know, what, how you are building a health system and, and eventually um, 
you know, Joya mentioned this oxygen, uh, but also you just launched a center for global health, which eventually is covering the entire region in sharing these best practices for pandemic preparedness and response. So if you have any comment, please go ahead. Sí, gracias, Anatol. Permíteme 30 segundos. Yes, thank you, Anatol. Just give me 30 seconds. I just want to comment about the vaccines. I see many questions related on which vaccine is better because the government is buying vaccine A or vaccine B. And this has a lot to do with political matters. In Peru, we are in the midst of a presidential campaign. We are going to have elections in a few weeks. Uh, there are many political promises and there is a lot of noise around vaccines. What we are saying here, especially to my colleagues who are listening to me, is the best vaccine is the one you have on your shoulder. And that is uh, something we should all work on so that can take place. Evidently, there are going to be more research, more vaccines, and hopefully we will have more access to vaccines. We are one of the countries who are lagging behind in terms of vaccine access. In terms of the question of what have we done to strengthen our healthcare system, we have implemented several strategies at the hospital level due to the demand of oxygen, the demand for equipment. We have encompassed several regions of the country. Peru has 24 regions and we have been able to reach over 20 regions at different levels of care. We have focused our efforts on the first level of care, not only for COVID, before the pandemic, this is just for your information. The official data is that 300 people would die in Peru per day due to any disease or illness. At present, we have an excess of 800 deaths. We have around 1,100 deaths every day. Out of 800, half of them are due to COVID. So the other half are due to other health problems, TB, HIV, chronic diseases problems in pregnant women and many other circumstances that are taking place. So part of our work here has to focus our efforts to strengthen those systems so we can provide a global, solidarity, equitable and comprehensive re response. When I say comprehensive is by reactivating the community health agent network, providing them with tools and technologies, we have created several chat box, different systems to connect people, systems with the community, with a healthcare system, not just to tell them if you have a phone, you have connect to this, but we have provided them with the technology, the equipment, our network of promoters, showing them how to use it so they can have access to the services. These are the, try, these are the type of things we have tried to do, and we have focused on the most vulnerable communities. We have implemented mental health care systems. We have uh, promoted social protection. Uh, we have found uh, many people who have no access to medications or very limited access to medications. We have even implemented logistical distribution of medications in the northern part of Lima to ensure continuity of healthcare services. Thank you. Um, thank you, Leo. That's really helpful. Look, I. Whenever I talk to you all, I, I can just go on and on. I just want to make sure that we are capturing questions from the audience. Um, uh, be, I know that's why I have you here because you know every time I speak with these or uh, with these panelists, I, I tend to go um, and lose control. So be keep keep the time and also bring the questions from the audience, please. Yes, uh, you know, we've had a few questions that have talked about, that have asked, asked about within the US, how are these inequities being addressed? And also what policies do we need to advocate for now uh, in order to enable global collaboration uh, for vaccine? And, and that would not only be specific to the US. So that, you know, that's, that's one question we might want to address. Yeah, so I wonder, um... Prof. Agnes, uh, from being a Minister of Health, I, I wonder if you would want to take that on, uh, what policies um, can we adopt and, and, and have in place to boost and catalyze this global collaboration? You, you, you talk about the global collaboration among government and international institutions. So I think, 
th there is a lot of avenue to do that, you know? We have the UN General Assembly where everybody is going there and uh, maybe this not this time because of COVID uh, being there before them, but they will find a way to talk to each other. We have also WHO with all ministers of has been the, um, the General Assembly, even if it doesn't work so well. We have other regional entities. Like if I start with my country, East Africa, NEPAD, African Union, we have Europe, Africa entities, and we have other global entities, like I said. However, if we let those entities again be led by the greed of the people who have against the people who doesn't have, we are going to face the same problem. Don't forget that WHO is the star in double standards. For the poor, it's good enough. For the rich, it's not good enough. Let's do something else. We have also the U UN General Assembly who is uh, like the African president talk because they are president, but apply nothing. So I think we need a little bit more civil society. We need, need a little more academic, but we also need to, be, to put benchmark saying, all policies that doesn't take in account the vulnerable should be dismissed. Maybe that day it will work. And let me tell you why it worked in Rwanda. When I was a minister of health and I brought, I bring a new policy to the president, the president was asking me first question, what it will bring to the vulnerable. Second question, do we have the budget? We don't have, no problem. Let's go and find the budget. So you see, put the vulnerable in the center of all your question and whatever you do is the only way to all be together safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Joya, you talked about the movement, right? Um, people's vaccine, let's go. Uh, Auntie, they want to get it. Uh, do you want to comment on that? What is the, you know, what do we do? policy-wide to catalyze that uh, global collaboration? Yeah, so I, I think um, we, we're we lucky because we have a president now in the United States who is thinking about some level of global equity. And so f there were several Americans, I think Americans by your uh, names and use of English on the chat, um, that you know are asking what we can do. We can put pressure on the Biden administration to waive the patents. There was a World Trade Organization meeting um, a, a few weeks back, and the U.S. decided not to uh, go against the patent protection, and that's the wrong decision. Uh, if we want equity, that has to be done now. We can also put pressure on um, the government to fund new. Uh, vaccine plants and development um, around the, the world from Rwanda to South Africa to Peru. Um, so I think we can ask, we can demand that our government as the wealthiest government in the world kind of use this moment to turn our swords into plowshares. You know, we have a multi-billion dollar military budget that could easily, maybe not easily, but could be used um, rather than, you know, to continue our endless wars to actually stop the real security threat to all of us, which is this uh, COVID pandemic. So I think as, you know, as American citizens, there's a lot we can do. As global citizens, I think, um, as Agnes says, there is there are really remarkable regional uh, leadership opportunities coming up. I mean, I'm thinking also of the Africa CDC, led very ably by Dr. John and Kanga Song, who, you know, have worked across the continent to help put together plans for the vaccine, help even procure vaccine. They have, I think, just the Africa CDC alone, which has funded majority of the funding is through the African Union, has procured 250 million doses of vaccine. So it's not enough, but it's really um, a part of that. So I think there is a lot we can do to, to support, raise our voices and support of 
actually spending money on this and getting out of this profit motive. Um, and one of the saddest moments I had very early in the epidemic, I mean, many sad moments that are personal, that, you know, people, you know, we love have died. Um, you know, Paul lost his father-in-law to COVID, um, who was a, a friend and a, you know, a, a, a beloved person to many of us at Partners in Health. But one of the saddest political moments I had is when someone said, well, probably, I, you know, we were all shocked the stock market was doing so well when people were just, you know, falling into penury and unemployed and dying. And someone said, you know, they probably did the calculations of how many people could die and get infected and how much the stocks would be, you know, uh, affected. And they decided that was acceptable. And we just cannot be that community. We cannot be that community that writes people off because they don't con contribute to global profit. Like that's just not who we are. And that is, you know, so several people asked in Spanish on the chat, what are the forces that we're dealing with? We're still dealing with this neoliberal force, this profit motive, this idea that people are expendable unless they contribute to the economy. And we have to change that fundamental principle. And this is an opportunity to do that. Something else I would like to add. Yeah, go ahead. That, please. Uh, at all those factories, you know, create a vaccine rapidly. I'm not surprised because they do that every year for the new flu of the year. So they did their job and it's okay. However, they did that with the taxes of each and every one. Even somehow my taxes went in because I'm paying for Nepal, for African Union, etc. in my taxes. And they contribute to those factories to create a vaccine. And when it is created, we don't have access to it. Every money invested in those factories the last 12 months should it pay back to the people or admit that these vaccines are ours to all of us and should be distributed equally. They don't own what taxes us pay. And yeah. Pay. yeah. So this is again, <clears throat> people manage to steal you money to pay their, greed, their, their greedy friends to produce something that will make them richer. And it's death of all my friends. Thank you. Um, you know, I always, I have a list of how I, I see you all. And uh, you know, one of, uh, the traits is being fearless and really uh, talk about what's needed. So uh, thank you for uh, speaking the truth and, and what really matters, especially to fight this pandemic and the future pandemics. Um, B, you have one question for Leo, then we, we're gonna move on. Hi, yes, there was a question about um, the impact of uh, COVID on refugee populations. Mm and how that is being addressed. And uh, I know that uh, that's something that uh, Socio Sen Salud is, is working on in Peru. So uh, Dr. Laka, maybe that, if you could speak to that. Yes, thank you for the question. Just to give you some background, most refugees and immigrants in the country come from Venezuela. Venezuela has a large population of migrants of 5 million people. Most of them are between Peru and Colombia. Here we have over 1 million of Venezuelans distributed around the country. Out of them, half of them have no access to any insurance. They are refugees who have not formalized their paperwork, so it's very difficult for them to have access. We have tried to help them out so they can approach the healthcare systems through mental health mechanisms. We have made agreements with some organizations such as UNAIDS, the Global Fund, to try to cover and meet all these demands. We are now working on some new initiatives about screening for TB among these people or access to HIV systems so they can have access to antiretroviral systems. It is difficult because they are informal people as many Peruvians and they earn on average 30% less in salary of what a Peruvian citizen earns. So 
uh, it is much more difficult for them to have access to the services. So we are trying to do this to protect them. And we're also working at the political level. But unfortunately, as I was saying, we're in the midst of a presidential campaign. So we have both sides, those politicians who offer helping these groups, but there are other groups of politicians who want to expel them. And many people follow this message, which are not right. And these are one of the problems we are trying to overcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Leica. So I wanted to suggest that we have a, uh, a pause uh, for a moment, uh, just to give our panelists a time to breathe. And, and we, we um, eventually going to have a quick intro because what we are discussing here is a part of this course, the pandemic preparedness and response and dynamic health systems resilience. So we're going to take a quick break uh, no, do, do not leave um, your computer. Uh, so we're gonna pose uh, on the panel side. I'm gonna have to invite our team, our um, my colleagues to to give an overview of the course. And 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 uh, Dr. Henley gonna give us what what are the requirements uh, you know for people to join the course and what are the ex expectations that we have. And eventually, um, Rose, uh, our colleague Rose, can have a give a quick demo of how to really access our learning portal. Uh, so, if you could do that, uh, that would be super helpful uh, because people are asking questions about how to, you know, access the course and what 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 are the requirements. So, go ahead, Dr. Henley. And if you want to share your screen, please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks so much, um, Manzi, and thanks to all of our panelists for their thoughtful, honest, and uh, provoking comments. Uh, you really gave us a great preview of the type of content that you will see in the certificate course, um, a course that will also provide you with the knowledge and the skills to many of the great questions um, that you have asked through the chat. So you'll see here on the, the slide I mean, you'll also be emailed um, after the webinar um, with a link to sign up for the certificate course. Um, and here's where you'll register um, in order to go through the different modules um, in order to complete the certificate. So after you sign up, you have to complete uh, three different things in order to receive the certificate. Um, you'll need to go through the content and activities for each of the eight modules that I outlined at the beginning of the webinar, including uh, questions um, on knowledge that you've gained throughout the module, um, as well as a final exam at the end of the course where you have to score a minimum of 80%. Second, there will be a, a discussion board and you will need to contribute to at least one original post to a question and to at least uh, two responses uh, to a colleague or another contributor. And lastly, you must also fill out an uh, end of course survey in order to receive the certificate. So I'll pass it over to my colleague Roz uh, to talk us through uh, the e-learning platform. Thank you so much, Phaedra, and thank you for covering those three course components. On this slide, you'll also notice a certificate uh, image in the bottom uh, left corner there in the middle of the screen. You will see that only upon completing all three components of the course that Phaedra just mentioned, and you will have to go to your unique profile. My picture is in the upper right corner, and when I click that, I can access my profile. And from there, when you open your user profile, that is when you will see your certificate of completion in the awards section. And that is only upon completing all three components of the course. And having said that, I would like to give you a sneak peek of what is in some of this course. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, well, let's, okay. Thank you for stopping your share. So I can share my screen. And I am in the PIH learning portal at this moment. I have signed in as you will need to do with your unique username and password that you set up. And so once you're in, you will see, as Phaedra just uh, showed a second ago, the three course components. The PPR 2.0 self-paced course is the actual course content. So you will click that, and I strongly suggest 
you can view the course here within this constricted area, but if you go to full screen, you will get a better view. And so I strongly suggest that you use the full view. You can access these modules in any order, but we uh, strongly suggest again that you start with the welcome module because here you will see some very important details about what you'll need to do to complete the course and you will see answers to various questions that you might have about the course, how it's structured, its goals and objectives, how the content is organized, how to navigate the course, what the requirements are for completion, and even information about the three organizations that were involved in the development of this content. On the left hand side is the navigation panel that you'll notice here. This is accessible with this small three line icon. If you click that, you can both expand and collapse it. And from this panel, you'll be able to select any module in particular. But again, we suggest that you start with the welcome. And I'll just scroll down to show you that beyond the eight core modules that were um, displayed earlier in this session, there's a conclusion session, uh, section that contains a summary of every module. I'll just click that quickly to show you that there you can highlight a particular module and get just the main the key points that were discussed within the module. So that's for every single module. The exam immediately follows that. And then you have a section of resources. I'll quickly click here on the resource list and show you another important feature. This entire course, all of its content, including links to various websites, uh, documents, and so forth, is contained in this downloadable PDF file. So if for any reason you were having challenges um, accessing the system on any given day to maybe go back to your course or whatever, you could, in the outset, download the entire course from this PDF file. So I just wanted to call your attention to that. And let me just show you a little bit about uh, how the content itself is organized in these various modules. Every single one of them is different, but they all share common characteristics. The module will start off with um, a visual that represents what the content is about. In this case, this module is about One Health and the links between humans, animals, and the environment we share. And so you'll see there's an appropriate photo chosen. And the content itself is developed from those case studies that were mentioned earlier. It's not just text-based. You'll have plenty of um, visuals to support that text. You will have interactive content elements to help you work through some of the, um, con the concepts that are presented. Also, there are, again, animations. There will also be um, videos in some cases, audio clips as well. Um, those are all available with captioning, so uh, you can control that yourself through the video player, turning on the captions as you choose and controlling the playback. The modules also include, I'll scroll past this kind of quickly just to show you that every case study upon which a module is based is included within that module, sometimes to direct your attention to specific questions um, that you'll need to read the case study as directed. Um, sometimes it's pointing you to a very specific section so that you can answer module questions. And I'll point out to you that um, you'll need to complete those questions before moving on. You'll have a prompt there that will not allow you to move on until you've answered the questions. And sometimes, let me uh, show you just quickly another module. I'll choose lessons from past pandemics. You'll notice again, starting with a, an appropriate photo module objective. So you will have an idea, you'll orient yourself to what you can expect to learn in that module. And sometimes in addition to the audio, the video, the illustrations, the photos, interactive pieces, you might also have, let me get a storyteller down below, in this case, an infographic um, about Socios and San Luke. Um, and I hope she's here. Yeah, um, for some of the content, sometimes we have a person who's, uh, you know, in essence serving as a storyteller. So these are just some of the ways in which the content from the case studies has been designed to engage you as a, learn a possible learner and participant 
and to allow you to interact with the content because that's important in a distance learning setting when you don't have an instructor right in front of you that you can um, you know, bounce questions off of. And to that end, that's why we've also included with this course a discussion board as one of the components so that you can have those kinds of lively discussions with um, discussion board moderators, with other course participants. And we've set that up with a series of questions that you can respond to. And the requirement for this course is that you make at least one original post and answer to one of the dis dis discussion board questions, and then two posts or responses to things that your fellow course participants have posted as well. So that's a way to keep that conversation flowing. So that again is just a sneak peek of the course and I don't wanna tell you too much or show you too much because I'd prefer as we all would that you all complete the course. So with that, I will turn it back to my colleagues and I thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thanks Rose. Uh, Liberty, do you wanna share some upcoming uh, offerings in uh, Spanish? Yes. Yeah, so. We're so excited to announce that this course will be fully available in Spanish. Um, we're hoping to launch the Spanish version of the course in mid-May. We don't have an exact date picked yet, but should have one selected in the next week or two. And we'll make announcements via social media and email. You can also register via the link we've shared in the chat to receive those updates. Um, and. We're so honored to be participating in such an incredible group of facilitators and administrators and have learned so much from them um, and are really, really excited to be able to offer this, this course um, free to all of our network in Latin America as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. So uh, let's wrap up from here. I um, let's, We can stop sharing screen uh, here. Um, yeah, I think back to our panelists, I want to offer, uh, you know, five seconds uh, to each of you. You know, I, I think as we wrap up, what is one message you would leave us with regarding what's next, especially with regard to pandemic preparedness and response? Uh, I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Leca. Okay, Thank you. Well, first, uh, again, to share my emotion, my excitement, uh, thanks for the opportunity to have in this course in Spanish when we launched four or five months ago, Liberty, the Global Health Center. That was uh, our idea, you know, to share the experiences of our global organization and to learn together. So this is an excellent example of uh, uh, that of something that can be taken to reality. Thanks really to the university, the UGIHE, thanks to everybody because we will put at disposal of all Latin American countries this. I see many people connected to the courses that we run. And I think that that is very important to actually strengthen the health systems. Uh, with regards to your question, what comes next? Well, in reality, what comes next is to continue strengthening the systems. We need countries to do more investment, not for COVID only, but for the global systems in general. We need more solidarity from everybody on our part. We will continue working so that this will be the pathway to be able to fight against these terrible pandemics. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joya? Yeah, I also just want to say thank you to all of the people who participated. We need all of you in a global movement to get out of this catastrophe. So we're, we're just so enthusiastic that there are so many people interested in this work. Uh, Professor Agnes. Um, thank you for organizing this Manzi, Fedra, and uh, Liberty, and everybody. I want uh, the people who have participated, I know that you are many, uh, so many, and that is good. But I want you, each of you, okay, each of you bring 100 more because the world needs it. And I want all of you to, to learn uh, all together how to be better advocates so that this not, not happen again, how to have better skills so that we can implement preparedness and response correctly. How could we have better strategic thinking to not fail in the trap 
uh, prepared by the people full of greed. Thank you. Mm, love you. We love you too. Um, uh, love you. Dr. Paul, if you want to uh, share, and again, uh, Joy mentioned about your family, um, you know, uh, condolences for your loss. And if you can wrap up uh, this really sharing, what's next? Well, first of all, you said five seconds, Monzi, so I assume you weren't talking to me. <laughs> uh, I can't say good morning in five seconds. Um, <laughs> I just want to go back to the point that my former student and current colleague Teo Zhen made in the chat just now, that Agnes, you know, summed it up. She said that the vulnerable, and of course she did this as minister, the vulnerable should be at the center of our attention. And she listed many reasons, epidemiological, uh, moral, uh, you know, and in the hopes of a really more humane future. And as Joya said, we need that pragmatic solidarity, pragmatic solidarity, right? That involves the materiality that we talked about it again. We need that to get out of this terrible dilemma. And uh, this, this group uh, and those who organize this certainly give me a lot of hope that we will get out. And if we don't, uh, if we don't dally, uh, we'll get out sooner rather than later. And we know that before us, there is a monumental amount of work to be done in Peru, in the United States, in Rwanda, in all the places where we've been lucky enough to work together. So thank you, Monsi and Phaedra and all the, and Roz and all of B, all of you who work so hard to, to make this seamless. Uh, I think I know how much work that, that takes. And we look forward to, to having as Anya said, why don't we have thousands of people taking this course? You know, not hundreds, thousands and tens of thousands. Literacy in these matters is a matter of life and death, as so many of us beyond my family know. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Thank you so much, our fearless uh, leaders and um, champions uh, in pandemic preparedness and response. So. We look forward to staying in touch with you because um, this is an online course. So we welcome you and we ask you to uh, share uh, the link uh, with uh, your friends so they could join the course. So thank you everyone and, and special thanks to everyone who's involved in, in making this happen. So we will see you uh, online and we see, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, B, I, I see you have something to say. Yeah, before you go, please take the survey that Liberty is about to share. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, if you can uh, fill out some of your views, uh, that would be super helpful. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Please do fill out the form.